You know I'm disappointed in you people. Yeah, I mean, I put, I put this feed forward capacitor there and a miracle happened. And you just sat there and took it. You know? Where's your tenacity as engineers, okay? You know, where, where's your intellectual tenacity as engineers? I mean, you know, why, why would you put up with abuse like that, you know? Does it, doesn't anybody want to ask me how I knew to use 330 pico? I pull this value out of the air and it happens, doesn't, you know? I'm so disappointed in you people, it's just, uh, I thought South Africa was a tough country. I thought everybody here was really tough, you know? The gap? The gap. Capacitor. Oh, I see. You, gap is a word for capacitor? No, I just... Let me, let, me, let me go out on a limb here. You say valve instead of vacuum tube, right? Is this, is this, is this where we're going here? All right. I get some nods. All right. I, I will use the term capacitor. I, I, don't, I can't quite get over to calling that a gap. Okay. Well, the way I knew to use 330 picofarad it's important to know how to find that value because you might, you know, it's different for different power supplies and you need to know how to find it. And here's how you find it. You try different values until you find the one that works the best. There's no equation. It, 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 no, this is, no, this is actually one of the big points I'm going to make today. There is no equation for the value of that capacitor. There, it just don't go there. You try... Well, yeah, that would be, uh, you, could, you could replace it with a, um, uh, um, you know, an air capacitor, a variable vein air capacitor, dial it in and then measure that and, uh, and go from there. That would be an excellent way of doing it. Um, if you can trust your technician to measure things correctly, I never really do. So what I do is um, instead of using a concrete value, I'm going to try a bunch of different values. All right, so this SPICE directive, I just typed the syntax in, but yes, there's a GUI to help you compose that SPICE directive. And um, uh, this step command says, um, run the simulation once for each different value of foobar, and the reason why I use foobar is to make it clear that it, it is not a keyword. It's just a user-defined parameter. Uh, so I'm gonna run the simulation once each for assigning a different value to foobar, and foobar will be the value of this output filter cap. Here I have these curly braces with the user-defined parameter enclosed inside the curly braces. Now what curly braces mean to LT Spice? what they say is, hey look, before you do the simulation, before you parse the net list even, evaluate the contents of the curly braces to a number. It might be expression, it might be you know, 3 times 12 times, you know, divided by foobar, it might be some expression. Here is just the one user-defined parameter. Evaluate the contents of the curly braces to a number and then replace the contents and the curly braces with that number and then the parse the net list and continue on the simulation. That's what foobar means. And so I run the simulation at the topmost level once for each different value of foobar. Now when I run this simulation, I see what the startup transient looks like for each different value of foobar. And I just pick the value that I like the best that works the best. But picking the value of FUBAR is a matter of multiple choice. It's not a matter of using an equation. The correct technique is the multiple choice method. If you use an equation, you're almost certainly doing the wrong thing. And that's something I'll get into later. So anyway, I want to know which value of FUBAR was used for this waveform trace. And uh, the way you query the value of FUBAR for these things is by using uh, the attached cursor. See, this is the mouse cursor, but there's also, there's also the possibility to attach a cursor to waveform data. To attach a cursor, you point at the plot label, the label of quantity to which you wish to attach a cursor, left mouse click, and now I have this cursor. And these are the sorts of uh, um, cursors that uh, uh, people like because laboratory instruments have cursors like this that you can slide around and query waveform data. In software, they're very rarely the best way of doing anything, but they're there because 
people used to look at laboratory instrumentation. That's the sort of thing that, you know, you could look at what these value, you could put out uh, uh, time value point pairs of the data. Okay, now I'm actually not even interested in that display. I just want to use the cursor to point at different waveforms. Now when you've initially attached the wave, uh, uh, an attached cursor to a data set, it'll be attached to the first simulation. To get the cursor to a jump to the next simulation, you use the keyboard up down arrow keys. If I press up arrow, the cursor will hop to the next simulation, which is lower on the screen. Up arrow, up arrow, up arrow. Now I'm pointing at the waveform that I like the best. And if you look carefully, you can see that it's infinitesimally underdamped here. It's just very slightly underdamped. So I find out what the value of foobar was for this. Now to query the value of foobar, I use the mouse cursor to point at the attached cursor. Use the mouse cursor to point at the attached cursor, and it says cursor one foobar was equal to 300p, and it was the fourth of six runs. It'll read out that data for you. So I just used the, that was the value just slightly under down. So I used the standard value above that one. That's how I got that value. So what I just did is an amazing thing. I used the startup transient analysis to optimize the feedback loop. That's something people usually don't see. But that is, in fact, the very best way of optimizing the feedback loop of a switch mode power supply. See, the thing is, when you, turn up, when you do the startup, this output filter capacitor looks like a short circuit. It looks like, it's short, it looks like an AC short and then it charges up that output filter cap. So during a startup transient analysis, the power supply goes from operating into a short circuit to ground to normal regulation. That's the biggest step load response you can give it. That's a full scale step, and I have a perfect response on a full scale step. And I'll never improve the behavior of this feedback loop with some myoptic small signal linear analysis about some, other, some specific uh, point of operation of the switcher. That's the best way of doing the feedback loop of a switch mode power supply is to start up transient analysis. And the way to get these component values, there are not equations for these component values. These component values, if you do a correct analysis of this power supply, it's a nonlinear circuit. You'll never solve this thing symbolically. Try the values that work the best. That's the only correct way of getting those values. And I'll go into some, I'll belabor this point later as the feed, how the feedback loop of a switch mode power supply works. Okay, now, um, so far the startup transient analysis, it answers the question, will it start up into the load, not destroy the load and supply it? Plus it's the best way of doing the uh, feedback loop, but there's more to the startup transient analysis than that. Anything you want to know about the switch mode power supply is exposed during the startup transient analysis. Uh, if you look at the waveforms during startup, and I'll show you how to do that for, um, for this particular thing here. Let's start with looking at the inductor current. Okay, that's the inductor current during startup. Now this power supply, the 1624, is advertised as constant frequency. And constant frequency is a desirable characteristic for a switch mode power supply to have. You know, if you're going to succumb to using a switch mode power supply just to improve the efficiency of your power converter, you're going to have this clock noise that you're going to interject into your system that you didn't want. And um, you would like to be able to pick that frequency to be at some frequency that won't interfere with the rest of your system and you would like it to stay there. So constant frequency is desirable and this is advertised as constant frequency, but when I look at the startup transient analysis, it may well be advertised as constant frequency, but it's not. When you first turn the power supply on, it is running at the wrong frequency entirely the wrong frequency. Now this low frequency behavior here is the um, frequency fullback feature of the controller. That's how the controller prevents from being self-destructed. It's a way to avoid self-destruction in the event of an accidental fault short circuit to ground on the output. It doesn't fold back the current, it folds back the frequency. Now to understand why frequency fullback is an effective strategy uh, in the interest of self-preservation, the event of an accidental fault short circuit to ground on the output, you need to understand that this is a current mode switcher. Now in switch mode power supplies, there's, um, there's different ways of categorizing switch mode power supplies. One way, which you probably hear more often, is the topology of the switcher. The topology is the arrangement of switches and inductors. Topologies would be buck, boost, suffix, zeta, chu, 
forward, fly back. That's the topology. Now, a different way of categorizing them is the mode of switch control. As far as the topology goes, I'm only going to do bucks today. Most power supplies are bucks. You're usually regulating an unregulated, you're usually trying to regulate an unregulated high input voltage to a lower output voltage. That's the normal situation. And it's the one you need to understand how to do very well. I'm only going to talk about bucks today. It's for the topology. For the mode of switch control, there are two modes. There is voltage mode and there is current mode. And um, Voltage mode is the older technique. It's maybe a little bit easier to understand. And a voltage mode controller is basically a glorified comparator. So here we have a comparator. That's the thing that controls the switch. In, out, and this is a buck topology. A buck topology entails an inductor connected to the output, and the other side of the inductor is alternatively connected to the input voltage or to ground. One of these two switches conducts, and the ratio of time it spends connected to the input versus the total amount of time. This is, this, uh, the ratio of time it spends connected to one or the other determines the voltage bucking ratio of the converter. Now to regulate the output voltage, the output voltage is sensed with the resistive divider. And the divided version of the output is compared to a reference voltage. This is typically 1.2 volts because you can generate a 1.2 voltage on an integrated circuit with fantastic temperature stability from minus 55 to 125. If it's, if it's 0.8 volts or 0.6, it's actually 1.2 volts internally divided down to a different reference voltage. If it's compared to a reference voltage, and then the difference between the divided version of the output and the, and the reference voltage, this is the error voltage. And the error voltage is amplified by an error amplifier and I'm only going to use transconductance amps for error amplifiers. I will not use op amps. The reason is I, I know what the output impedance, I know I don't have to drive a low output impedance. I don't need a low voltage. If you make an op amp, you have to put this voltage follower stage on the output of your gain stage so that you can, so that you're sensitive, you're insensitive to whatever load is connected to the thing. Well, I don't need to drive that low voltage, so I don't need to put that voltage follower there, which all, if you don't need the low impedance, all you're doing is slowing down the bandwidth of the air amplifier. This is just a better way of doing it. Basically, I don't print the output stage so I don't have to charge for them, and it works better. It's win-win. But, so a, a transconductance amp amplifies an error voltage to be a current. And that current is read out to a voltage with a compensation network. And that is an amplified version of the error voltage. That goes into one side of the comparator. In the other side of the comparator, I put a high frequency triangular wave. And these three component elements are chosen such that this voltage changes very slowly compared to this high frequency triangular wave. The comparator then compares a DC level with a triangular wave, makes a duty cycle, and the duty cycle is adjusted to get the right output voltage. That's the basic invention of a switchboard power supply, and that was the method that was used in the 1970s. In 1978, current mode was invented. And current mode is a vastly superior way of controlling a switch mode power supply. Now, whereas voltage mode is a glorified comparator, current mode is a glorified flip-flop. Set, reset, and output. And that's the thing that controls the switch. Again, a buck converter. Output is here. The uh, output voltage is again sensed with a resistive divider. Divided version of the output 
is compared to a reference voltage. Again, the difference between these two, that's the error voltage amplified by an error amplifier, which is again a transconductance amp. And the transconductance error amplifier is read out with a compensation network, so I again have a amplified version of the error voltage. Now from there over, everything is the same as voltage bow. The only difference is that's a flip-flop instead of a comparator. Now the way that comparator is, or the way that flip-flop is uh, driven is there is a clock. And the clock is the thing that sets the flip-flop. There's a series of pulses. And the clock pulse comes in, sets the flop, output goes true, and the switch turns on, and the inductor is connected between the input and the output. The voltage drop across the inductor then makes the current in the inductor rise. And the flip-flop is reset once the inductor current rises up to a value proportional to the voltage on the output of the error amplifier. So to do that, you need to sense the inductor current. There is a current sense amplifier. And once the inductor current ramps up to value proportional to the voltage on the output of the air amplifier, you reset the flip-flop. Okay. This method was invented in 1978. By the 1980s, it took over switch mode power supply design, and nobody has looked back since. Now, just why current mode is better than voltage mode is something I'll get into in about an hour. But all you need to know right now is that that's a current mode controller. And to implement current mode control, you need to sense the inductor current. Well, there's lots of ways of sensing the inductor current. This one just uses a, um, a current sense resistor. But, you know, yet other controllers will use the controlled MOSFET as the current, sen as the current sense resistor because the, um, the controller is controlling the MOSFET. The controller knows whether the MOSFET is on or off. All the controller would have to do is look at the voltage drop across the MOSFET when the MOSFET is on and it gets the current. Those are uh, no R sense controllers. Yet other controllers can use the inductor component as the current sense element because the inductor component actually has ESR. That is to say the uh, equivalent circuit of, of this inductor looks like an inductance in series with a resistance. So, if you were to put two external uh, components around it, you put a, um, uh, an RC circuit to average the waveform of the output of the, uh, uh, across the inductor like this, if you, if you put these two components around it and then uh, diabolically arrange this RC time constant to be equal to this L over R time constant, this time constant of integration will cancel this time constant of differentiation and the waveform that you get across the capacitor is the waveform that would have been across the ESR of the inductor had it been a discrete lump constant. This is inductor current sensing. I believe it to this point because it's an important technique. You beat this big waveform and integrate it down to exactly the low level waveform you need. So it's a great technique. That's inductor current sensing. Um, and uh, we have lots of parts that use that. But this one is just a, uses the original. I use this because it's, it's so illustrative how switch mode power supplies use. But this one here uses a current sense resistor. And notice that the current sense resistor, the job of the current sense resistor is to sense the inductor current. But the current sense resistor is not in series with the inductor. It is in series with the switch. And that is a jolly good thing. Because the point for sensing the inductor current is so you know when to reset this flip-flop. Once you reset this flip-flop, you do not need to know the inductor current anymore. You're just waiting for the next clock pulse to come in and waiting for that switch to reconnect the inductor to the input voltage. You only need to know when it ramps up to that value. You don't care how it ramps down. So, uh, the fact that you put the current sense resistor here instead of here, you're sensing the current here instead of here, that's great because when you turn the switch off, you switch the current sense resistor out of the circuit so it doesn't dissipate power anymore. Uh, that improves the efficiency. And plus, another thing about buck con controllers, buck controllers are ranked by how high of a voltage bucking ratio they can support. And so uh, if you have a high performance buck converter, 
uh, you're bucking a big voltage to a little voltage, that means that that switch is off most of the time. So you're almost never putting current through the current sense resistor. It's a good thing. But the fact that the current set resistor is there in series with the switch and not the current has the consequence that while you're trying to measure this cur inductor current, you're actually measuring this current. And the difference is these spikes of current. When you first turn this transistor on, this node goes from just below ground because the diode is conducting to the input voltage. It's a huge change in voltage across that shocky diode, and that shocky diode has a lot of capacitance. I mean, really, this, this shocky diode, it's the most capacitive thing in the whole circuit. Well, except for the output filter cap. But other than that, it's the most capacitive thing in the whole circuit. So you have a huge displacement current. Here you can see there's amps of displacement current through the shocky diode. And the problem with the spike of current is the whole idea to this is you turn on the flip-flop here and you wait for the inductor current to ramp up to this value. But before you're weighted, you have this noise spike bigger than you're looking for coming through the thing. So that's the problem. All right, you have to ignore that spike. Now you could look at this and you could say, oh, well, I could pick a, um, an RC filter in front of the current, current sense amp and I could pick a time constant that would make this waveform look something like this. And I could still measure my peak current and make this spike below the peak current. That's true, and that was the method that was used in the 1980s. But, um, and it would work for this particular point of operation of the switcher. But say though, you didn't need very much load current. Say the only peak current you needed was not here, but down here. Then you'd need a very long time constant to uh, make this spike small compared to this lower peak current. And um, that would give you a very long minimum on time, which would give you very little dynamic range of duty cycle left to control the output current. Um, so that's the problem with doing that. And if you look at this circuit, you can see there's no RC filter in front of the current sense amp, and there's none in the IC either. This IC doesn't need that RC time constant because the, uh, the 1624 has high, spe high speed blanking logic. That is to say that the current sense amp is momentarily shorted to ground when you close the switch. So the deal is a clock pulse comes in, grounds the output of the current sense amp, and sets the flop. Then by the width of this pulse later, it unblanks that. You know, depending on which controller, this might be as little as 100 nanosecond. And then that means you would unblank this thing at this point, and then you could mo start monitoring the current you know, with full high speed and fidelity and measure the thing. So uh, this, stuff like this, this high speed blanking logic, this is, this is why you use controllers to base your, you, you base your switchboard power supplies on controllers for switchboard power supply design and not 5-5 timers because they're, they're, they're deep glitch with this type of blanking logic. All right, now, so it's great you're using a controller that high speed blanking logic uh, because you can ignore that spike. It gives you a very wide, very wide range of duty cycle to control the output current. But that blanking logic still does give you a minimum on time, and that minimum on time still isn't zero, and it might be too long under some conditions. For example, if this output, if the output is momentarily connected, if this output is accidentally shorted to ground, then when you turn the switch on, the inductor is connected between ground and the full input voltage. That's the biggest voltage available in the system, and the current in the inductor runs, ramps very fast and that minimum on time might be too long. You might overshoot the desired peak current through the inductor, which goes through the switch and could blow up the switch. That's where frequency foldback comes in. The controller looks if the output is shorted to ground. If it is, it slows the frequency down so that um, uh, uh, that same minimum on time is a much, much lower duty cycle. And the way the uh, detector detects it, the way the controller detects that the output is shorted to ground is the feedback pin drives two signal paths. Here's, let me draw this. This is the feedback pin. The feedback pin drives two signal paths. One goes to the air amplifier, which is the normal uh, feedback loop, but the other uh, signal path that it drives is the short detector. 
and one side of the short circuit detector is connected to the feedback pin, which is a divided version of the output, and the other side of the, of the short circuit detector is the divided version of the reference. Okay? So this thing detects when the feedback voltage is too low, say by a factor of three. If the feedback voltage is too low by a factor of three, the controller assumes it's shorted to ground and slows the clock down, maybe by a factor of 100. That's frequency foldback. Now this might look like a sloppy way of detecting a short circuit to ground. The circuit says, oh, the feedback voltage is too low by a factor of three. The output voltage must be too low by a factor of three. I must be shorted to ground. I'm going to go, on, I'm going to go into short circuit protection mode. Seems sloppy. But the fact that it works that way is also a jolly good thing. Because the problem with this thing being connected to ground is when you turn this switch on, you have the full input voltage across the inductor and the minimum uh, uh, on time might be too long. Well, say it's not connected to ground. Say it's connected to one volt. When you turn the switch on, you still have a huge voltage across the inductor and the current ramps still very fast and it, and it would still blow to the ground. So this circuit is actually looking for the uh, abnormally high voltage across the inductor. And the abnormally high voltage across the inductor happens when the feedback, pin, when the output voltage is low. Normally when you turn the switch on, it's connected between the input and the output, but the feedback voltage is way low that it knows that abnormally high voltage across the inductor, and it goes in the frequency foldback mode. Um, that's what it's doing, and uh, I have to tell you that in the fact that it's running at the, the wrong voltage, yes, it's running at the wrong voltage, you're getting EMI products where you didn't anticipate them, but you know, you might not care because your rail is low by a factor of three and the system isn't running yet. So that's, that's frequency foldback. Now let me tell you I'm a really big fan of frequency foldback. Let me show you. Let me actually just run this thing into a short circuit. and um, look at the inductor current. Okay, the inductor current here goes up to five amps. That's the current limit. So that means that this power supply will actually operate at current limit into a short circuit. And that is as good as it gets because if the output voltage is low, you want to put as much um, uh, uh, current as possible into that low output voltage to correct the low output voltage as quickly as possible. This thing will actually operate at current limit as the same, uh, it'll say, operate at the same current limit at, uh, into a short circuit as it will in normal operation. This thing is square operating area, okay? That's what the thing does. Um, but, you know, let's think about this. I'm saying if you walk up to the switchboard power supply, you can walk up to the switchboard power supply and wrap a paper clip between the output terminals. It will actually operate at current limit into that short circuit. Let's say you did that, and then you realized, oh, it, it's Friday. It's my turn to go pick up the kids from school. I gotta go. So you leave, okay. Then you come back to work on Monday, and you look at your bench, and you see that paper clip is still there. Are you going to have to call up Alltech and beg for a new demo board, you know? Well, let's look at the power dissipated in the MOSFET. And to plot, dissipate, uh, plot dissipation, you point at the quantity you point at the component, hold down the alt key, and plot this dissipation, and let's look at this waveform. Okay, it has these spikes of dissipation, and these spikes go up to, oh, 70 watts. Well, 70 watts is not a disco party, all right? I mean, I've been calling these things power MOSFETs, but that's not actually true, is it? They're little tiny surface mount devices with no heat sink. So you're, you can't dissipate 70 watts in this thing. It would be brighter than an than a illuminating LED, all right? So, but you know what? Let's see how long it dissipates 70 watts for. 
Um, I'm going to zoom up on the, one of these spikes, and I want to measure the width. Now, I could slide cursors around and measure the width that way, but this is a much easier way of measuring the width, and that is to pretend like I'm going to zoom. I'm going to pretend like I'm going to zoom into this region, and as I'm drawing this, this zoom box, it's reading out the size of the box down here. And so the distance from there to there, this distance, is 3.6 nanoseconds. All right, it's 70 watts, but 3.6 nanoseconds. Well, well, that might be okay. I mean, 70 watts for four nanoseconds? Maybe the transistor doesn't know it's dead yet, right? Maybe it's okay. So what's happened is I've plotted dissipation as a function of time, and all I found out was that dissipation as a function of time is not what I'm interested in. When people say dissipation, they actually mean average dissipation. Average dissipation is a physical quantity that powers a calorimeter. So I need to integrate this waveform to find out the average dissipation, and we're in luck because the waveform viewer can integrate. So I point at the plot label of the quantity that I want to integrate, hold down the control key, left click, and it says 40 milliwatts. And that's the miracle of frequency fullback. I can walk up to the switchboard power supply. I can wrap a paper clip between the output terminals. It will operate at current limit into that short circuit. And the MOSFET runs cooler than under normal operation. That's the one fan of frequency fullback. All right, the management back there is just about champing up the bit for me to take a break. So we will take a break now. And um, 15 minutes, how much time? So I'm going to plot two waveforms. This is the voltage on the output of the air amplifier, and this is the inductor current. Now we can see current mode operation happening because the, uh, the idea to this is the peak, the peak inductor current is controlled by this voltage. So you can see the waveform and the output of the air amp. You can see the envelope of peak inductor current. The envelope of peak inductor current is reflecting the waveform you see on the output of the air amplifier. So you can see that current mode operation. <coughs> and, um, but if you look very carefully at these two waveforms, you can see that this control implements slope compensation. Now what slope compensation is, it's a fix to a grave problem that happens at that, that happens in fixed frequency peak current mode control at high duty cycle. Here's the deal. The premise to this is that by controlling the peak current with this voltage, I'm controlling the current, the average current. And that, um, that premise is based on the fact that the inductor waveform is just a triangular wave. So if I control this voltage, if I move this, I'm sorry, if I control this current, if I move this current up and down, the whole wave will move up and down. The whole, whole wave will move up and down with the peak, okay? And, um, the, um, and that premise comes, is, is based on the fact that the average current is related to the peak current up to an offset current between the two, okay? However, at high duty cycle, the peak current does not control the average current on a cycle by cycle basis. There's an ambiguity between the two and that leads to a um, instability that causes a, um, a frequency, frequency content at half the switching frequency. It's a subharmonic oscillation where one pulse, this top switch will be left on for too long, the next pulse will be on for too short, too long, too short, too long, too short. That causes frequency content, makes EMI uh, uh, content at the output at half the switching frequency, which isn't desirable because being at half the switching frequency, it's a lower frequency and harder to filter. Plus there's another problem. In practice, that instability is rich in stochastic noise because of the difficulty in sensing the inductor current. And uh, that means that, I mean, um, I mean, this is the situation. It's bad enough, you're taking all the energy in the world chopping it and trying to make it look at, like DC again. It's bad enough that you're doing that. 
But you're not just doing that, you're FM modulating it. And you know what FM sidebands look like. They're not like AM sidebands that simply summon difference frequencies. If you single frequency FM modulate a carrier, you get many sidebands that follow these pretty Bessel function envelopes that go on forever. But you're not single frequency FM modulating it. It's a noisy modulation, so you actually get frequency content physically in the inductor at every, in, at every frequency, not encoded in a sideband, but it's actually physically in the inductor at every frequency. And since the capacitors are piezoelectric and the inductors are magnetostrictive, you'll hear this power supply may make, make noise because there's physical current in these reactances at every audio frequency. You'll hear this thing makes noise. That's is slope compensation. And slope compensation gets its name from the way that it is implemented. Okay, so if you do this, it's gonna oscillate. So we're not gonna do this. We're gonna have a flip-flop. We're still gonna set it by a clock. But what we're gonna do that's different is we will reset it by a different quantity. And instead of resetting it according to inductor current, we will reset it according to a slightly different quantity. We will add a waveform to the inductor current. Okay, so. The clock will put out two waveforms. It puts out the clock pulses, and it puts out a slope function, okay? And we will add some of this slope to that. So the, the waveform we see on the input of the, uh, 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 the comparator that compares the inductor current to the voltage on the output of the air amplifier will be a sum of the inductor current plus a plus a slope just unilaterally added to it. If we do that, we eliminate the ambiguity between peak current and average current on a cycle by cycle basis and get rid of, the, rid of the instability. And if we look at these two waveforms very carefully, we can see that that is exactly what that controller is doing. And the way we can see that is by looking at this part of the, uh, of the simulation. In this region, the output of the air amplifier is a constant voltage because it's at the positive rail. It's just hit the rail, and so if we have a constant voltage on the output of the air amplifier, we should have a constant peak inductor current, but it's not a constant peak inductor current. This is less peak inductor current than that, and that's because of slope compensation. See, the duty cycle is changing in this region. Let me add some more plot, let me add some more waveforms. So here I have the input voltage, and here's the output voltage. When the top switch is on, the voltage across the inductor is the difference between these two waveforms. When you first turn the power supply on, you have the full input voltage across the inductor, and the current, and the, and the current ramps up very fast, and you leave the switch on for a very short period of time in order to ramp up to the peak current. Once the output voltage increases, you have less voltage across the inductor and you have to leave the switch on longer to ramp up to the same current. But if you leave the switch on longer, you've added more of this to the ramp of the inductor current. And since the fixed quantity will be the sum of this plus this, if you have more of this, you'll have less, less inductor current. And that is why that is less peak inductor current than that. Now, one thing about the startup transient analysis is that sometimes it's the only way of seeing the slope compensation function. Here I've drawn it just as a straight line, but usually the slope compensation function is not a straight line. It is usually a proprietary function, okay? And uh, the person that wrote the data sheet for the controller He's all enthralled with what a great proprietary function this is, and he wants to sell it to you, but he doesn't want to tell you what it is. Okay, so how are you going to find out? Well, during the startup transient analysis, the power supply will simply operate over all duty cycles. It has to have that function in it, or the model is just wrong. Okay, so one thing about the startup transient analysis, sometimes it's the only way to see the slope compensation function. I mean, basically, during startup transient analysis, it just runs over all duty cycles, and the controller just exposes what the thing does. That's one thing about the startup transient analysis. Literally anything you want to know about the controller is shown during startup, and that's why I like to do startup transient analysis. And let's talk about something very simple now, the most basic thing. This is a controller for controlling a MOSFET. Let's talk about how it electrically drives that, all right? Now, that MOSFET is an N-channel MOSFET, which is great because it's easier to buy N-channel MOSFETs than P-channel MOSFETs. There's a larger selection. They're cheaper. You know, for a given die size, the N-channel MOSFET will have less RDS on. Or for a given RDS on, it requires less gate charge to enhance the channel. 
Situation is, the secret's out, N-channel MOSFETs are better than P-channel MOSFETs. So it's great that you can use an N-channel MOSFET there. But the N-channel is a somewhat inconvenient polarity to use in a buck regulator. The thing is, the N-channel MOSFET, its job is to connect the inductor to the input voltage rail. Well, when you connect the inductor to the input voltage rail, you want to fully turn on the transistor you want, in order so that you have as little voltage drop across the transistor as possible. You know, the deal is the power associated with the voltage drop across the switch is dissipated as heat in the switch, whereas the power associated with the voltage drop across the inductor is stored in, as energy in the flux of the inductor. The whole idea of a switchboard power supply is you withstand the voltage between two different rails with an inductor instead of a switch. All right, so. When you turn this on, you want it fully turned on, which means you want to fully enhance the channel, which means you want to pull the gate voltage well above the source. But when you do that, the source is at the input voltage, and that means you have to pull the gate voltage well above the, source, well above the input voltage. And that's the problem. This is a 12 volt to 5 volt buck. I got two rails, and the 12 volt isn't even regulated. But somehow, I need a voltage, I need 18 volts on the gate, to enhance the MOSFET, and I don't have an 18 volt rail, and I don't want to have to buy my power supply a power supply. That's the problem. Now, when I, um, the easiest way of explaining how this problem is fixed is to first describe how the circuit is implemented, then I'll describe its operation. Now, the, um, the 1624 has an integrated gate driver, and by Integrated, I mean printed on the same piece of silicon. So there's a controller and a gate driver. And these are both lithographed on the same piece of silicon. Now, despite the fact that the gate driver is mechanically printed on the same piece of silicon, the gate driver is floating. It's not connected to the same ground as the controller. It's just mechanically on the same silicon. It's not electrically connected to its ground. Now, think of the gate driver as a four-terminal device. Input, output, power, and ground. Let's talk about where these four pins are. The input is not bonded out to a wire. It's connected to the controller, and it's probably a differential signal because it's not at the same potential as the controller. The other three are bonded out to pins, and that's exactly what that pin is. It is no more or less than you know, the output, ground, or power of the gate driver. These are pins. Now, the output of the gate driver goes to the gate. And the ground connection of the gate driver, that is the pin called switch, and that is connected to the source of the MOSFET. So now you can see the gate driver is referenced to the source of the MOSFET. So the gate driver can, you know, turn its, you know, puts its voltage reference to the uh, source of the MOSFET. The positive supply of the gate driver is the pin called boost. Okay? And now you see what C3 is doing in that schematic. C3 bypasses the power to the gate driver. Okay, that's what C3 is there. All right, now the normal situation for controllers with integrated gate drivers is that the gate driver is mechanically printed on the same silicon as the controller, but they're floating and they're not powered. You have to power them from someplace. This product is, a, uh, is an exception to that normal situation that the boost pin is powered from VN. And the circuit that powers it is an LDO, a three terminal regulator, a low dropout regulator, regulator followed by a diode. That's the way it's implemented. Now the, the circuit, so that means that the boost pin, if you were to solder a resistor to the boost pin and connect the other end of the resistor, if you were to solder a resistor to the boost pin and, solder, and connect the other end of the resistor to a laboratory supply, if the laboratory supply is dialed down to zero, you see the LDO voltage on the boost pin as you increase the voltage on the laboratory supply. Uh, eventually, if you drive it ab uh, above the LDO voltage, you can drive the boost pin volt voltage high, and you can drive it as high as you want to. The only limit is um, uh, breaking something down, and that's why there's an absolute maximum rating of the boost pin voltage on the data sheet. So you don't 
uh, reverse bias that diode. Now this is the way it's implemented. Now that I've described the way it's implemented, I can describe its operation. When, the, when this switch is turned off, this node is just below ground because this diode is conducting. So this end of the capacitor is connected just below ground, and the boost pin is powered from the end, so you put a voltage slightly above the LDO voltage across that capacitor. Okay? When you turn this switch on, the gate is pulled well above the source, the channel is fully enhanced, and the source voltage starts slewing positive, and this capacitor bootstraps the boost pin with it. And there's the boost pin voltage going well up. This is the input voltage. There's the boost pin voltage going well above the input voltage. We can differentially pro uh, probe the gate source voltage. Here, uh, add plot pane, and we'll probe the gate source voltage. That's the voltage across the gate source and you see it goes up to a little more than um, a little more than five volts. All these controllers use logic level MOSFETs. They're not high voltage MOSFETs, they're all logic level MOSFETs, and they have to be fully enhanced with five volts. The data sheets will usually give a, um, uh, usually rate their RDS on at four and a half volts. Okay, so now we're finally done with everything I wanna say about startup transient analysis. Um, you know, it's the only simulation you can do that will tell you whether or not the power supply qualitatively operates or right or not. You know, will it start up in the load, not destroy the load and power it? It's the best way of doing the loop design. And anything I want to know about the controllers exposed during the startup transient analysis. Now, there are some questions that a startup transient analysis doesn't answer. For example, this isn't the usual case, but it can happen that the person that wants the power supply knows what the power supply should do. That's not the normal situation, but it's possible. For example, say, um, uh, say uh, uh, you have so this power supply is going to drive uh, a CPU or some FPG, it's gonna drive some you know, massive digital circuitry. Well, that massive digital circuitry might vary its clock speed and abruptly change the amount of charge that's pumped through this massive amount of digital circuitry. So you have this big step load uh, uh, behavior and when you go through that big step load, you have to make sure that the error, that the voltage never deviates too many millivolts away from what it's supposed to have so the digital logic is ex properly executed by the gates inside this massive amount of things. So then you, what you have to do is you have to look at the transient response for that step load and make sure that the, you can count the millivolt deviation during this transient response and see that's right. Anyway, I'll do a transient response of this thing. And most people would use a current source. I'm going to use a switch because it's conceptually more similar to what you do in the lab. 